Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, I welcome you all in the 19th session of the course of administrative law. In earlier sessions, we have discussed the different aspects of the administrative law, the different rules to be played by the administrative law in making the administration as strong and efficient and on the other hand to protect the rights, liberties and freedoms of individuals. In the present session, I will talk about the topic, the constitutional protection to the civil servants. Why the constitutional protection to the civil servants is necessary or it, is, it should be the essential part of the administrative law? The justification lies in the fact that the efficiency, the strength, the development and the democratic value of any country is pronounced and determined by the administrative machinery, by the civil servants of any country. The civil servants or the administrative machinery is known as the backbone, is known as the strength of any country because the functioning and working, the style of working of the civil servants or the administrative machinery of any country, it pronounces the democratic value and the level of the development of any country. It is also true that the political interference in the administrative machinery, the political interference in the working of the civil servants may hamper the basic values and the development of the administration and then the country also. It becomes true, particularly with reference to the parliamentary form of the government, where the civil servants or whole the administrative machinery works under the supervision of the political team or under the supervision of the politicians and therefore, there may be the chances for the influence of the popular will in the functioning of the administration. And this influence of pol political will, if it is in negative manner, may hamper the basic standards of the functioning of the administration and therefore, to save or to protect the civil servants from any such kind of negative things, it is essential that some protection should be given to them so that they may perform their duties, they may perform their obligations, they work in the free environment without any fear, without any pressure. And therefore, I have chosen this topic under the course of administrative law to study that what are the constitutional measures, what is the constitutional mandate and how the constitution of India protects the rights of the civil servants or the interest of the civil servants. And therefore, I have come with this topic, the constitutional protection to the civil servants. 
as i told you that it is more likely when the civil servants are to work under the supervision of political forces in democratic world and particularly in the system of parliamentary form of government that the political and personal influence in the working of civil servants may weaken the strength of administration and thereby hamper the progress of the country and the development of the country in order to ensure the independence and impartiality of the civil servants in the performance of their duties in the performance of their functions it becomes essential to protect them from any such influence in order to ensure the progress development and prosperity of the country and to ensure the welfare of the common people it is essential to have an independent efficient honest committed and fearless administrative machinery such an administrative machinery can be established only by strengthening the administration by shielding civil servants from political pressures and personal influences therefore the makers of our constitution included the provisions in the constitution itself to provide for an effective scheme of protection and safeguards to protect the interest of civil servants against any kind of political pressure and the personal influence friends we are only the country where the constitution itself provides for the law relating to the service matter of civil servants the idea of the constitutional protection to civil servants came into the mind of our forefathers to make the civil servants immune from the political whims and fancies it is also the fact that india is also one of the countries where the large number of suits are filed by the civil servants against the state this large volume of litigation in service matters increased the burden on the already overburdened judiciary on one hand and on the other it contributed in delay in justice delivery system particularly in service matters and this state of circumstance also gave rise to the dissatisfaction in the government servants and if the government servants are dissatisfied if the civil servants are not working with their full satisfaction then it may hamper the development of the country civil services in our country are modeled on british model of civil services the tenure system has been adopted in place of a spoil system being adopted in america in america the spoil system is adopted whereas in india with the pattern like britain the tenure system has been adopted meaning thereby that the tenure of any civil servant the tenure of any government employee is fixed under the law itself in this regard the supreme court of india has held that though the government is the sole authority to provide for conditions of service in civil services and it can also change unilaterally these conditions it can create abolish and fill any civil post at its own discretion but a civil servant can claim reinstatement when the government makes illegal termination in the case of sankarayan versus state of kerala which was decided by the supreme court of india in 1971 in this case of sankarayan versus state of kerala the supreme court very clearly held that it is the discretion of the government it is the discretion of the state to regulate the conditions of service under the civil services but the government should regulate these conditions of service in accordance with the constitutional norms in accordance with the provisions or the principles of law prevailing in the country this is the benefit of the tenure system to the civil servants or to the employees or the civil servants that if any member of the civil services if any civil servant is 
dismissed from his services he can claim his reinstatement because he had the fixed tenure to serve the nation and therefore the government is obliged not to remove any person from his services from his employment without any ground or without the implementation of or the adoption or follow up of the principles of natural justice in this background article 323a and article 323b were inserted in the constitution of india by way of 42nd amendment in 1976 this amendment was made by the indian legislature by indian parliament in the constitution to confer the power on parliament to provide for alternative institutional mechanism to deal with the service matters as i have already told you that the increase in the litigation relating to the civil services matters or relating to the service matters there is the burden on the courts which are already overburdened in the country like india there has always been the problem of delayed justice and it is said that the justice delayed is justice denied when the courts are already overburdened with other forms of litigations and there is the increase in the service matters before the court then again the court would become helpless to provide the speedy justice with this purpose or in this background through the 42nd amendment article 323a and 323b were included in the constitution and parliament was made empowered to provide for an alternative institutional mechanism to deal with the matters relating to the service by this amendment the service tribunals were introduced in india one enactment was also passed the administrative tribunal act 1985 the administrative service tribunals were established by parliament by enacting administrative tribunal act 1985 under the exercise of its powers under article 323a and 323b of the constitution the part 14 of our constitution of india deals with services under the union and the states under part 14 the provisions relating to constitutional protection to the civil servants are found particularly article 309 article 310 and article 311 article 309 authorizes empowers the parliament and the state legislatures to regulate the recruitment and conditions of service article 310 provides for the tenure of service of civil servants and article 311 talks about the procedural safeguards see the part of this whole scheme under the constitution to give the constitutional protection to the civil servants in part 14 article 309 article 310 and article 311 article 311 authorizes the parliament and the state legislatures to regulate the recruitment and conditions of service as it was held by the supreme court of india also in the case of sankarayan that it is the discretion of the government to regulate the conditions of service in civil services and therefore the parliament should be empowered to lay down the law to enact the legislations to make the rules to make the law to regulate the service conditions no doubt this is the authority of the legislature that the legislature can lay down any law for regulating the conditions of the service then article 310 provides for the tenure of service of civil servants then article 311 talks about the procedural safeguards when article 309 authorizes the parliament to make the law 
for regulating the conditions of service in civil services. When article 10 provides for the tenure of the civil servants or for the post under the civil services, then it is also important to provide for the security to provide for the protection to the civil servants against any kind of discriminatory legislation, against any kind of discriminatory norms, against any kind of discriminatory or arbitrary standards, against any kind of discriminatory and arbitrary legislations being made by the parliament. And therefore, article 311 comes forward to give this security to the civil servants against any such kind of discriminatory, arbitrary, unreasonable conditions of service, discriminatory, arbitrary and unreasonable regulations, discriminatory, arbitrary and unreasonable laws being made by parliament. If we see article 309 of the constitution, it relates to the recruitment and conditions of service of persons serving the union or the state. It provides that subject to the provisions of this constitution, acts of the appropriate legislature may regulate the recruitment conditions of service of persons appointed to public services and post in connection with the affairs of the union or of any state. The parliament is given the authority to make the appropriate regulations to make the appropriate to put the appropriate conditions to regulate the recruitment and conditions of service of persons appointed to public services not private services persons who are appointed in the services under the union or under the state so if anybody is appointed to the or there is any employment under the state or the union then the appropriate legislature in case of union services, the union legislature, the parliament and in case of the state services, the state legislature would be the appropriate legislature. It is important to know that what this term appropriate legislature means that with regard to the services under union, the parliament or the union legislature would be the appropriate legislature and with regard to the services under any state, the legislature of the concerned state would be the appropriate legislature and therefore the appropriate legislature the union legislature or the state legislature as the case may be would be authorized to regulate the recruitment to regulate the conditions of service under the union services under the union or under the state no doubt this authority is given to the parliament and the state legislatures but if we See article 309 carefully, cautiously. This authority of parliament and this authority of state legislatures is subject to the provisions of the constitution, meaning thereby that the authority given to the parliament under article 309 to make the law for regulating the recruitment for regulating the conditions of service is subject to the provisions of the constitution. The basic standards, basic, basic constitutional principles which have been laid down in the constitution, those cannot be violated by the union legislature or the state legislature at the time of making the law. And therefore, particularly the principles of natural justice should be followed by the union legislature or you can say that the legislation or the law being made by the union legislature or the state legislature as the case may be shall be should be permeated with the principles of natural justice should be permeated with the basic or the fundamental constitutional principles should be permeated with or should be in accordance with the provisions of the constitution and particularly the provisions of part 3 of Indian constitution that is the fundamental rights of each and every person. It means that 
under article 14 every person is entitled for the equal protection of laws and the equality before law including the persons who are serving the nation either as a part of union services or as a part of state services it prohibits the union legislature and the state legislature to make any discriminatory laws to make any unreasonable laws to make any laws which are arbitrary in nature to make any laws which are violative of fundamental rights which are violative of even the principles of natural justice only those laws can be made or those regulations can be made to regulate the conditions of service and the requirement in public services which are in accordance with the standards which are in accordance with the principles which are in accordance with the provisions which are in accordance with the requirement of part 3 of indian constitution if you see the next part of article 309 though this authority is given to the parliament that the parliament can regulate the requirement or the conditions of service under union or state under the union or state services but this authority is subject to some norms in article 309 the main content of 309 itself it has been made subject to the provisions of the constitution then see the proviso according to the proviso provided that it shall be competent for the president or such person as he may direct in the case of services and post in connection with the affairs of the union and for the governor of the state or such person as may be directed in the case of services and post in connection with the affairs of the state to make rules regulating the requirement and the conditions of service of persons appointed to such services and post until provisions in that behalf is made by or under an act of the appropriate legislature under this article and any rules so made shall have effect subject to the provisions of any such act we know that two kinds of laws are there two kinds of legislations are there the legislations being made by the parliament or the law being made by the parliament and one delegated legislation which is made by the executive so though the parliament is entitled to make the law for this purpose but pending the making of laws by the parliament or state legislature the president of india with regard to the union services and the governor of a state with regard to the services under the state are competent to make the regulations are competent to make the rules to regulate the requirement and the conditions of service so you can see two kinds of authorities which can lay down the norms for regulating the requirement and for regulating the conditions of service in civil services number one the parliament and the state legislature as the case may be the parliament or the state legislature as the case may be and number two the president of india and the governor of a state as the case may be there are two aspects of the civil services which are to be regulated or which are required to be regulated one at the very initiation of these services when the requirement is made and any person is adopted any person is appointed so the requirement is required to be regulated at the initial stage and then when he is appointed then what would be the conditions of the service of that person as the member of civil services so these are the two aspects and both the aspects of the civil services are to be regulated by the parliamentary law or by the rules being made by the president of india or the governor as the case may be we can see after observing after going through article 309 that article 309 empowers the union and state legislatures to frame the rules regulating the recruitment and conditions of public services and the post under the union or any state 
the proviso to article 309 empowers the union and state executive to frame the rules for the purpose of regulating recruitment and service conditions of public services until the legislature legislates on this point number 3 the power of the executive and the state legislature seems to be coextensive but the power of the executive is subject to the power of the legislature though the executive that is the governor of any state or the president of india can also lay down the rules can also make the rules for regulating the recruitment or the conditions of the service of any person under public services and parliament can also make the law but this authority of executive is always subject to the authority of the legislature though the executive the governor or the president can make any rule to regulate the recruitment any aspect of recruitment or the conditions of service on which the parliament can make the law but when the parliament has enacted the law on that point the authority of the executive exhaust the authority of executive continues only till the parliament does not make the law on that point next you see the opening words of article 309 indicates that the service rules contained in an act enacted by the appropriate legislature or the service rules made by the governor or the president or the government must follow the mandatory requirement provided in other provisions of the constitution particularly like article 310 article 311 and article 320 at the same time these service rules should also conform the standards and requirements under article 14 article 16 article 20 clause 1 and article 21 there are some judgments of the supreme court of india in this regard katyayani dayal versus union of india which was decided by the supreme court in the year of 1980 in katyayani dayal versus union of india the supreme court held that the power of the government to make the rules under article 309 is subject to the power of the legislature to enact a law regulating the recruitment and the service conditions of public services so the article 309 was interpreted by the supreme court in this case and same observation was made to which we reached to the conclusion by discussing article 309 that the power of the government the power of the executive to make the rules under article 309 is subject to the power of the legislature to enact a law regulating the recruitment and the service conditions of public services another case which was decided by the supreme court of india in 1964 is the moti ram deka versus north east railway north east railway frontier motiram deka versus north east railway frontier in this case the supreme court was of the opinion that the rules of railway code providing for the termination of services of permanent employees for giving them the notice for a period as provided in the rules were considered to be violative of article 311 we will see that under article 311 the opportunity of hearing has been made must has been made condition precedent for the purpose of removing any person from his employment and without adopting without following this particular norm of principles of natural justice without giving the proper notice not only the proper notice but in addition to the notice by giving the fair and adequate and sufficient opportunity to 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 present his case before the authority or to make the explanation he cannot be removed from the services so the government cannot make any such rule by which 
only by giving or serving the notice, it can remove any person from his permanent employment. Then the next case is the West Bengal State Electricity Board versus Desh Bandhu Ghosh. This West Bengal State Electricity Board versus Desh Bandhu Ghosh was decided in 1985 by the Supreme Court of India. And in this case, the Supreme Court holds that the service rules which provide for the termination of service after giving three months notice was arbitrary and therefore these were declared to be violative of article 14. This is the purpose for which in enacting article 309, the authority of parliament, the authority of state legislatures and the authority of the government, union government and the state government, the authority of executive. So, the authority of legislature and the authority of executive to make the rules for regulating the requirement and conditions of service. That authority of legislature and executive was made subject to the provisions of the constitution. And these provisions of the constitution as I already told you specifically are 310, 311, 320. And generally, these provisions may be Article 14, Article 19, Article 21, etc. In the case of West Bengal State Electricity Board versus Desh Bandhu Ghosh case, the Supreme Court declared such rules which were to remove or terminate any employee, any person from his services by giving three months' notice was declared to be arbitrary and thus violative of article 14. We know under the article 14, though in the doctrine of reasonable classification was introduced, but after the case of E. P. Royappa versus state of Tamil Nadu, the Supreme Court recognized the role of article 14 to protect anybody from the arbitrary action on the part of the government. So, article 14 is also available to protect a person from any arbitrary action or from the arbitrariness on the part of the government. Government cannot, it means the government cannot make any arbitrary rule and if it makes any such rule, it is considered to be violative of article 14. And friends, under the constitutional law, we know that the state is not allowed to make any such rule which is violative of any right conferred by the constitution in part 3 or which is violative of the fundamental rights. Under article 13 clause 2 itself, the state is prohibited to make any law which takes away or which averages any fundamental right or any right in part 3. It means whenever any such rule is made, whenever any such law is made either by the parliament, either by the legislature or by the executive, which is arbitrary, it is always violative of article 14 and then the conjoint reading of article 14 and article 13 2, such a rule cannot sustain. The same was observed by the Supreme Court of India in the case of West Bengal State Electricity Board versus Desh Bandhu Ghosh. We can also refer to the case B.S. Yadav versus State of Haryana. B.S. Yadav versus State of Haryana was decided in 1981. In this case, it was held that legislature could make rules having retrospective operation and effect subject to the conditions that there must be the sufficient nexus between the objective of rules and the retrospectivity. It means that it is not sufficient for the government that it is authorized by the act to make such rules, but at the same time the government is obliged to show that there was sufficient nexus and reasonable and rational justification 
for the application of such rule retrospectively. See friends, the decision of BS Supreme Court of India and BS Adav versus State of Haryana, it talks about another provision of the constitution. You can see article 20 clause 1. In article 20 clause 1, the protection is given against the retrospective operation of law. The protection is guaranteed against ex post facto laws. Ex post facto laws means the laws which have the retrospective operation or which have the retrospective effect, meaning thereby that if any rule is made, generally it can be applied prospectively, not retrospectively. And if it is applied retrospectively, it would be violation of article 20 clause 1, which is also a fundamental right in part 3 of Indian constitution. The same was recognized by the Supreme Court of India in B. S. Yadav case. Generally, the article 20 clause 1 prohibits the retrospective operation of any law, the retrospective effect of any law. But when in under the uh, course of under the subject of constitutional law, you will go through the details of this article 20 clause 1, you will find that a categorization is made that within the area of civil law, the government can apply the rules retrospectively, whereas in the field of criminal law, it cannot be applied retrospectively, particularly when it goes in the disadvantage of the accused or the convict. It means that in the area of civil law, the retrospective operation of the rule may be made. But that retrospective operation of the rule in matters of the civil law, as the service matters are also relating to the domain of civil law, they are falling in the domain of civil law. So, in service matters, it means that retrospective effect of any rules can be made. But that retrospective, according to the decision of the Supreme Court of India and B.S. Yadav case, that retrospective operation of any such rule cannot be made or the rules having the retrospective operation, having the retrospective effect cannot be enacted by the legislature or the executive only because the reason that the legislature or the executive was authorized to make the rules, was authorized to enact the law, was authorized to make the rules. Only for this reason, only because of this reason, the retrospective operation or the rules having the retrospective operation cannot be validated. What additional should be there in addition to the authority of legislature or the executive to make the law on any aspect of the subject, any aspect of the service matters? What should be there? That there must be the sufficient nexus in giving the retrospective effect or retrospective operation to law and the particular conditions in which the law is going to be effectuated. The sufficient nexus should be there, the Supreme Court observes that there must be sufficient nexus between the objective of the rules and the retrospectivity. Without any such nexus between the objective of the rule, the objective of the law and the retrospectivity of the rule, retrospectivity of the law, that law cannot be held valid and it would be considered to be violative of Article 20, Clause 1. Then, the state of Mysore versus Padmanavacharya, decided in 1966 by the Supreme Court of India, and also the Syamlal versus state of UP, decided in 1954. In these cases, the Supreme Court held that the words conditions of service see carefully. It was held that the words conditions of service under article 309 are comprehensive 
and inclusive and include within its scope the rules dealing with compulsory retirement. But such a rule which validate a past retirement illegally done is outside the scope of Article 309 and hence is not valid. In this case, again the Supreme Court of India observed or recognized the authority of the legislature or the executive to make the rules to regulate the conditions of service with respect to all the aspects of the service, including the compulsory retirement. It is the discretion of the government that the government can make the rules for compulsory retirement and it can compulsorily retire a person in the service. But if a rule validates any such compulsory retirement which was made illegally or any rule, any law which validates any illegal retirement, any illegal compulsory retirement, that is not the valid law that cannot be said to be the constitutional law and it is always invalid, it is always unconstitutional because a law cannot validate an illegal thing or illegal action on the part of the government. So, this is the whole domain of the scope of Article 309, wherein the government, the legislature are empowered to make the rules, to make the law regulating the requirement and conditions of the service under the public services, but subject to the condition that these may not be violative of the constitutional provisions, these may not be violative of the basic or fundamental constitutional principles, these may not be violative of the fundamental rights of the citizens. Come to article 310 of the constitution which provides for the tenure of office of persons serving the union or state. Article 310 provides for the tenure of office of persons serving the union or a state. As we know that in India, the British model or the tenure system was adopted and therefore, 310 specifies the about the tenure of the service. See clause 1, except as expressly provided by this constitution, every person who is a member of a defense service or of a civil service of the union or of an all India service or holds any post connected with the defense or any civil post under the union, holds office during the pleasure of the president and every person who is member of a civil service of a state or holds any civil post under a state holds office during the pleasure of the governor. Two phrases are very important in article 310. That is the pleasure of the president and the pleasure of the governor. So, any person who is a member of defense service or civil services, civil service of the union or he is a member of all India service or he holds any post connected with defense or any civil post under the union. So, all the employees, all the persons serving the union either in defense services or civil services or they hold the post otherwise, they have the tenure. What is the tenure? they holds office during the pleasure of the president. So, the tenure of the service of such persons is dependent of the pleasure of the president and any person 
who is in service under the state or who holds any post in connection to the service under the state, he holds the office during the pleasure of the governor. So, this is the tenure of service. The tenure has not been fixed in the form of some years or some duration of time, whereas the tenure has been fixed as it is during the pleasure of the governor with respect to the services under the state and the pleasure of the president with respect to the services under the union. Clause 2, notwithstanding that a person holding a civil post under the union or the state holds office during the pleasure of the president as the case may be of the governor of the state, any contract under which a person not being a member of a defense service or of an all India service or a civil service of the union or state is appointed under this constitution to hold such a post may, if the president or the governor as the case may be, deems it necessary in order to secure the services of a person having special qualifications provide for the payment to him of compensation if before the expiration of an agreed period that post is abolished or he is for reasons not connected with any misconduct on his part required to vacate that post. Though the duration of the service or the tenure of the service depends on the pleasure of the president, on the pleasure of the governor, as the case may be. But if any such person who is not the member of defense service, who is not the member of all India services, who is not the member of civil service of the union or the state, he is appointed under this constitution to hold such a post. May a president or the governor, as the case may be, deems it necessary in order to secure the service of a person having special qualifications, provide for the payment to him of compensation, though the tenure is dependent of the pleasure of president, but the additional security can be given if the government wants to take the services of any such person who is having the special qualification and who is not the member of any defense services, who is not the member of any civil services under the union or state. So, in additional conditions, conditions may be provided in the contract itself that he is specially appointed and he will be given the compensation if he is removed from such assignment before the completion of the period for which he is appointed. That means that though it is the pleasure of the governor or the president, but a specified time or duration of the service or the specified tenure of the service may be prescribed or may be given in the contract itself. Friends, the tenure of civil servants is made subject to the pleasure of president or the governor of a state by article 310. This doctrine of pleasure which has been adopted by the makers of Indian constitution under article 10 has been adopted in India by importing it from England. This is not the Indian doctrine. This doctrine has common law origin and is grounded on the principle of public policy that the civil servants should be responsible, accountable and answerable to the government and receptive, approachable and sympathetic to the people of the country. So, this restriction has been used, has been put on the tenure of the service that they can be removed from their offices if they are not receptive, they are not approachable and they are not sympathetic to the people of the country. They must be responsible, they must be accountable and they must be answerable to the government. By for making the employees or the civil servants accountable to the government, responsible to the government, answerable to the government, the tenure of their services has been made dependent of the pleasure of the president who is the 
head of the executive of the union and to the pleasure of the governor who is the head of the executive of any state. This common law doctrine, the doctrine of pleasure, consider the civil service not to be contract and therefore it can be terminated by the government at any time without assigning any reason. Simply we see the doctrine of pleasure. So, this doctrine of pleasure does not consider the service as the matter of contract. If though the president or the governor can make this as the matter of contract by uh, specially appointed any person for taking the his services who has the special qualifications, but generally the doctrine of pleasure means that the service is not considered to be the contract and therefore it can be the person can be removed or it can be abolished at any time by the governor or the president without assigning any reason. This doctrine of pleasure also means that on such termination of the service, the civil servant cannot claim any compensation or arrears. Two are the important aspects of the doctrine of pleasure. Number one, that doctrine of pleasure does not consider the service under the union or under the state as to be the contract and therefore a person can be removed from his services at any time by the government if he is not found responsible accountable to the government, he is not found receptive to the or approachable to the public, he can be removed from his services, he can be dismissed from his services at any time. This is the first aspect or first meaning to the doctrine of pleasure. The second aspect of doctrine of pleasure is that whenever any person is removed from his services because the fixed tenure has not been given, there is no contract and therefore he cannot claim for any compensation, he cannot claim for any arrears because the service was not the contract and it was not regulated by or by the conditions of any contract. It was just up to the pleasure of the president and the governor and they removed the person from his service when he was not found answerable, accountable to the government and when he was not found the approachable and receptive to the public. These are the two meanings of doctrine of pleasure. In India, the doctrine of pleasure has not been adopted as such as its common law meaning, but it is adopted in some modified form. As I told you that doctrine of pleasure means two things. Number one, that the service is not contract and therefore it can be terminated at any time. And number two, that the person cannot claim any compensation or any arrears. At the same time, the Indian doctrine of pleasure is different or modified form of the common law meaning of doctrine of pleasure. It is subjected to the procedural safeguards under article 311. This is the unique feature of the constitutional law relating to the service matters. Though the doctrine of pleasure has been adopted, but that doctrine of pleasure is made subject to the procedural safeguards given in article 311. And it is further subjected to the entitlement of civil servants to contest the termination of their services contrary to the service conditions and fundamental rights and to claim the arrears of salary or the compensation. So, though in its origin meaning under the doctrine of pleasure, the, the government employee cannot claim for any compensations or arrears, but under the Indian law, there are certain cer conditions of service by which the service is regulated and article 311 is there. So, if these procedural safeguards have, have not been adopted by the government, have not been followed or it is against the conditions of service, then he can claim his reinstatement, he can claim even for compensation and arrear. It has been held by the Supreme Court of India in the case of Samser Singh versus State of Punjab that the power to dismiss any civil servant at pleasure is not the personal right of the governor or the president, but it is an executive power 
and it has to be exercised in accordance with the aid and advice of council of ministers. It differs with the English doctrine of pleasure in one more sense that in India it being the part of the written constitution cannot be retracted or nullified by any law made by the legislature and the executive. In contrast, the common law doctrine of pleasure in England can be turned down by the parliament, but in India it is a part of the constitution, it cannot be turned down. The article 311 is important with regard to the procedural safeguard to the doctrine of pleasure. 311 places two limitations on the doctrine of pleasure that there shall be no dismissal or removal from services by any authority subordinate to the appointing authority and the opportunity of fair hearing shall be given to the civil servants before any such dismissal or removal from services. Though it is dependent on the pleasure of the governor and the president, but two procedural safeguards are to be followed. Number one, that the person cannot be removed from his services or dismissed from his services by any authority subordinate to the appointing authority. Only the appointing authority or the authority hired to the appointing authority can remove and the opportunity of fair hearing shall be given. The proper notice should be given. The person should be given the opportunity to explain his case before the government and according to the opinion of the Supreme Court in the case of Union of India versus Sardindu, in matters of statutory appointments, the doctrine is limited by the terms of statute because the appointment and termination are always governed by the provisions of the statute itself. Article 320 also puts a limitation on the doctrine of pleasure. Then Article 311 in the Constitution of India, this relates to the dismissal, removal or reduction in rank of persons employed in civil capacities under the union or the state and it puts two important restrictions over the authority of the government to remove any person from procedural safeguards are there. The doctrine of pleasure in India is subject to the procedural safeguards and the procedural safeguards given in article 311 must be adopted, must be followed by the government. Otherwise, the removal or the dismissal of the person from his service would be considered to be unconstitutional. That is all. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude immoral, vulgar and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvellous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. 
None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.